Yeah. Anyway, let's talk about fucking Tennessee, dude. Okay. There's an old sign in Texas, probably Tennessee. Oh, maybe it's in Texas. They fooled me once. Shame on you. Cool. Shame on you. Fool me twice. <laughs> you can't fool me again. That. That. That reference dates me so fucking hard because that is a certified, certified GW reference right there. That's a classic. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, Tennessee and its endless How's endeavor it, to be the absolute worst fucking place in America uh, took action, okay? Good took some serious fucking action. That action revolved around uh, stopping all vaccination campaigns for minors. Like, absolutely the worst. Just think about just how, think about how bad some of these states are. Tennessee opened its audience, uh, opened its doors to Ben Shabibo, and things have not been the same. Evening, a political play or sound scientific advice? A stunning new development tonight in the political tug of war over COVID-19 vaccinations in Tennessee. An email obtained by News Channel 5 Investigates reveals that Governor Bill Lee's administration told health officials not to do anything to promote immunizations of any kind as kids prepare to return to school. Dr. Michelle Fiscus, who was the head of Tennessee's vaccine program, emailed August is National Immunization Awareness Month, and we would typically do a new release, a governor's He's proclamation, and communications free. out to local health departments and partners. She added, please let me know if we'll be permitted to acknowledge the occasion. The health department's medical director replied, per the commissioner, no outreach at all. On Monday, that top vaccine official was fired. Dr. Michelle Fiska says it was for political reasons. News Channel 5's Kyle Haran met with the woman today at her home to give us an in-depth look at the situation. She Thanks says it's all because it. of information she provided having to do with something called the mature minor doctrine. By talking with her, you can tell. Oh my God, that is so loud. Well, Dr. Fiskus is still trying to come to terms with her termination. The immunization job I absolutely love. It's it's the perfect job for me. I'm a pediatrician. Vaccines are in our DNA. Doctors are liars. Why'd you become a doctor? Pediatrician sounds a lot like pedo to me. Why do you want to be a doctor of, of children? From Scotland. Independence huh? let's go. You wanted to be a child doctor? You could not be a adult doctor? Folks, I'm telling you right now. Swag. I'm telling you right now. Only children should be allowed to be doctors for other children. Okay? Going forward, me out. no adult doctor is allowed for children, only mark. other children, you look okay? okay so far. Doesn't matter, it's like my cousin, who's very hot, mind you. I mean, she takes good care of the kids, and she's a child. Why not? She could be a doctor, you know? All right, let's keep going. And hey. But she says her focus on vaccines, which is in her job title, is what got her fired. The legislature took up this issue with the mature minor doctrine, and um, they all decided that um, the way to resolve that was to Hassel. fire me from my position. Here's what Dr. Fiskus thinks started it all. Back in May, when the demand for vaccines dropped, she says she was getting questions about what a provider should do if someone as young as 14 came in asking for a vaccine. What I did was put out a memo with factual information, um, information about where the guidelines are around vaccinating minors or providing medical care to minors without parental consent. That has been in Tennessee case law since 1987. She provided the mature minor doctrine, case law that states a physician can treat someone as young as 14 as long as they believe the child is mature enough. Then, this happened in the government ops committee. It's very disconcerting to see the letter or memo from uh, Dr. F F Fiscus, Fiscus um, 
stating that Tennessee law allows the Department of Health to give vaccinations to children 14 years of age. That's Republican Senator Janice Bowling. She says the doctrine is not code and not law. But Dr. Fiscus says the rule is clear. The firing of me doesn't change the the case law in Tennessee. It doesn't, uh, kids that are 14 and older can still go get vaccinated today, just like they could get vaccinated yesterday. Um, they wanted to make this a giant issue. She says she is a victim of politics. In a state with already some of the lowest vaccination rates, she believes some are choosing their aspirations in politics over their duty to public health. She mentioned both Governor Bill Lee and Dr. Lisa Piercy, the commissioner for the Department of Health. Is the vaccine safe for children? As far as we understand, the vaccine is safe for children ages 12 and older. Um, it is certainly safer than contracting COVID-19. She's not sure what's next for her, but doesn't think it will be in Tennessee. Kyle Horan, News Channel 5. Thank you, Kyle. The governor's office declined to comment. They said it is a personnel matter, but you can read reaction to Dr. Fiscus's firing and the state's vaccine policy on newschannel5.com. Anyway, so yeah, Tennessee's top vaccine official was fired as a punishment for doing her job in the face of political push pushback. This is not the first, nor will it probably be the last instance of a medical professional getting fired from their jobs for doing their actual jobs, which happens to be vaccinating people. Her job literally was in this circumstance to provide evidence-based education and vaccine access so that Tennesseans can protect themselves against COVID-19. And uh, she literally got fired for doing that. It's like, it's like being in charge of, uh, I don't know, reproductive health for women. Has in Tennessee, ironically, or Alabama. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you're, you're going to get fired if you do your job appropriately. Like, the entire purpose, what, what you're supposed to be doing there Fog. is to, you know, not actually do your fucking job and do everything but your job. That's the only way to do it. She got fired for relaying the law to people. Yep. Friend of the show, Olivia Rodrigo, went to the White House yesterday to urge teens to go out and get vaccinated. Let's take a look at what happened there. All right, so I have a special guest with me today. Uh, joining us in the briefing room is actress and multi-platinum recording singer-songwriter Olivia Rodrigo. Who well, not friend of the show, but fan of the show, I guess. Hasanabi head. Olivia Rodrigo who traversed red lights and stop signs to see us. If you know her music, you'll get that dad jokes there um, thing. And we just want to thank you for using your platform and your voice for elevating the important issue of young people getting vaccinated. She's here today to meet with the president and Dr. Fauci later this afternoon. But she agreed to come say a quick hello to all of you. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Olivia. Hi. Um, first, I want to say I am beyond honored and humbled to be here today to help spread the message about the importance of youth vaccination. Uh, I'm in awe of the work President Biden and Dr. Fauci have done and was happy to help lend my support to this important initiative. It's important to have conversations with friends and family members, encouraging all communities to get vaccinated and actually get to a vaccination site, which you can do more easily. You wish you were a celebrity in Hollywood. What a weird thing to say. ...than ever before, given how many sites we have and how easy it is to find them at vaccines.gov. Thank you, Jen, for having me today, uh, and thank you all for helping share this important message. It's so appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Thank what is this? Uh, Senator Joni Ernst. Take a look at what she had to say. What is the, what is the new fun thing? Uh, Bidenomics that uh, the senator from Corn is talking Texas about. This resulted in the biggest surge in inflation in nearly 13. Yeah, dude, inflation actually occurs for no other reason than whoever the president is at the time. There is no reason to like look to other, uh, you know, other externalities, other uh, important factors that might play a role in it. It's just Joe Biden became the president and inflation. Um, 
I love that. I love the, the economists, you know? It, it, once again, Republicans and just politicians in general show us all the time that you truly do not need to know any single fucking thing other than, uh, you know, toe the partisan line and try to be as entertaining as you possibly can in order to become a politician. I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's like... It's showing the rest of America that you too can become a politician. Like, you literally do not need to know anything, okay? Definitely not the most basic uh, comprehension of economics. That, that's, you don't need that. Years. For Iowans who are living on a... Oh, speaking of which, the inflation also, I forget, before I forget, like, inflation is always bad. Inflation can't exist in a healthy economy. Always bad. It's never good. Always down, bad. More to go. Uh, Let's and, go. Uh, you know, it's just definitely that. A too. budget. These unpredictable price markups are making every purchase a real guessing game. They keep finding themselves asking if the price is right. To demonstrate just how much costs are spinning out of control, I've brought the wheel of inflation with me here today. Each of the numbers on the wheel represents a price increase for a common household product. It'll tell us exactly how much more Bidenomics is costing hardworking Americans. So folks, let's go ahead and give it a spin. Oh, let's see, eight, eight. In the past year, the price of bacon is up about 8%. Let's give her a good spin. Okay, five, and it is a black five. In the past year, the price of clothes is up about 5%. The price is 5%. always going up, bro. If you don't acknowledge the president is responsible, then how can you even be responsible for the top of the hour ad break poggies? 11. In the past year, the price of... How is this any different than Pokemon go to the polls? But somehow even worse, because like, the Pokemon go to the polls was like an attempt at reaching a younger audience. It was a gigantic failure. But this one, like you're literally targeting your own constituency and your own age demographics. And you're still fucking it up. Time to do the price is right. Hassle, 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 Auto hassle, hassle. insurance is up 11%. And if you go uh, to the 17 there, you'll find that hotel rates the price has gone up 17% in the last year. There's no winning the numbers on this break. wheel. Again, every number. The only reason why they can run, the only reason why they're using this as a, as a criticism, as a talking point is because like, there's really nothing else. There really isn't anything else that they can fucking shit on. Thanks for keeping us informed. Okay, there really isn't anything that they can that they can fucking criticize. So they're just like, well, uh, inflation. There's inflation. Prices are rising. I'm months. drinking the boomer beverage okay. of choice, Represents by the way. The increase of a common good American consumers are dealing with. There's no winning numbers on this wheel. No matter yeah, how you spin one. it, we simply cannot afford any more Bidenomics. What has Joe Biden done as far as like economic policy that may or may not have uh, it changed inflation? What is Bidenomics? Can someone explain that concept to me? What, what is Bidenomics, Jack? What do you think had more of a significance on, on inflation? Donald Trump or Biden's uh, stimulus package? Trump administration was the one that printed 40% of our current dollars in circulation. Yeah. I, I found this Teresa. I found this uh incredible tweet earlier today. Okay. I forget who said it, but it's like I think it might have been like a la liker. But it was saying like it's incredible that, you know, two thousand dollars 
in government uh, checks was able to permanently destroy the restaurant industry and made people just leave work and never look back. Jammies, 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 Just remember the things that you have, you know? Jammies, 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 I don't think it's that big of a problem, obviously. I think that it's a problem that could be solved. It was 3,200. I saw the tweet earlier. Yeah, whatever. However, having said that, you know, there is a solution for it. It's for commerce to, instead of lobbying the fucking government, actually raise their goddamn prices. Raise your fucking time. wages, dog. And there are measures that you can put in place to, uh, you know, manage and control inflation. But nobody wants to raise interest rates. So, I don't know. Tax wealth hoarders and raise interest rates. Go ahead. Yo. If inflation is that big of a problem, the solution is clear. Raise taxes and raise interest rates. Three checks totaling $3,200 over 18 months basically destroyed the restaurant industry's ability to hire employees is a good reminder to treasure what you have because everything is a lot more fragile than you think. Also, absolutely zero people have an answer for why inflation has occurred and increased despite the fact that our interest rates have remained uh, as low as ever. Thanks for all the great content. Appreciate Despite the fact that wages have not meeting. increased. Love how Republicans this notion that uh, raising the wages is going to skyrocket anyway, inflation. So why not go all out? Well, there's ways to manage it. So obviously, a world-changing pandemic that killed millions. I mean, more than half a million here in the United States. Like, that could have nothing to do. Nothing to do with... Uh, the current situation. Shut the fuck up. It's Price is Right wheel, dude. It's Price is Right wheel time. You, you fool. Senate you, do, you lack the processing power to understand that it's just, it's Joe Biden, dude. Chat, can I get an alien? Crats PLS, now have alien, a PLS, new $3.5 trillion PLS, dollar spending PLS. plan in place. It's an effort to finance major aspects of President Biden's agenda and is okay. separate from the bipartisan infrastructure deal. Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said the plan will bolster Medicare and include dental, vision, and hearing coverage. This is what Bernie Sanders fought for, even though. We would also like to see a Medicaid ex uh, Medicare expansion where the eligibility uh, minimum is lowered to 55, but uh, can't have that. Hi. It would also add major funding for clean energy, according to a Democrat. Wait, did it lower? I thought that they wouldn't lower it. Well, I don't know what the details are yet of the uh, infrastructure plan so far or the spending plan in general. I thought that was in contention. And, oh, no, yeah. A call to lower the age for Medicare from 65 to 60, not 55. And progressives are still fighting on lowering eligibility from 65 to 60, but not to 55. Also, we don't know what the, uh, we don't know what the details are of this yet. It's coming out now. Representative Jayapal says she's been told that the budget resolution will include enough funding to both lower the Medicaid, uh, Medicare eligibility, age, and expand benefits to cover dental, hearing, and vision. Previous reports suggested only the latter was likely. Okay, that's this is like prime, baby, happy very new news. This is as recent as fucking 40 minutes ago. So, that's cool. Um, so, we got funding for clean energy. I mean, this is still pretty almost half of what the progressives wanted to the tune of six trillion dollars so this is going to be this is a neutered bill to what Let's the original bill was going fast. to be but in order to maintain uh democratic support across the line across the entirety of the party line because you do have people like uh warner and also uh you know mansion and uh, other moderate 
Democratic senators who have their own constituencies that don't even give a shit about, like, fiscal austerity, but they make it seem as though they do. In order to make them come to terms with this bullshit, uh, they had to, uh, you know, make it seem like they were lowering Drink her goddamn water. Uh, the spending. Democratic aid, the agreement would prohibit tax increases on small businesses and people making under $400,000. President Biden will join the, the Senate Democratic strike. lunch today to discuss details of the plan. As Senate Democrats were negotiating their new spending deal, the bipartisan group of 22 senators were hashing out the last remaining issues of their own plan. They are hoping to nail down details of the $579 billion deal before the end of the week. The next step includes the Congressional Budget Office doing a cost... No, I didn't say Warren. I said Warner, not Warren. ...cost analysis to see if the provisions in the agreement will actually offset the cost of the bill. Doing the math. Let's bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent and host of Way Too Early, Casey Hunt. Also with us, MSNBC contributor Mike Barnacle. So, Casey, these two plans kind of working their way down the road, road side by side. What's at stake here and, and what are the potential pitfalls? Well, I mean, this is basically uh, the definition of success or failure for the Biden administration, the way they've set this up. They've said to voters, we're going to put the these ambitious plans in place. They know that they need to do it uh, ahead of the midterm election so that they can show that they have actually taken action and followed through. And we are now on this two track strategy that we've been uh, following. I don't know which number infrastructure week we are on by this point, delivery. but they are hoping that it's one of the last me. couple, at least I for the bipartisan the plan. Biden's they really want to get it done this summer. And that big uh, okay, I'm going to give you guys some of the details, okay? From Sahil Kapoor. Bernie Sanders, Senate Budget Committee Chairman on policy targets in the $3.5 trillion bill. Now, we don't know the full details of this bill yet, okay? We don't know. Lowering the Medicare age to 60. Expanding the Medicare benefits through dental glasses dental vision and hearing aids, negotiating drug prices. There's money for child care in there. There's money for climate in there. There's immigration and green cards uh, reform there as well. There's the PRO Act, and there's tax hikes on wealthy plus large corporations. These are going to be modest tax hikes. Don't get too fucking excited. Okay? Now, that last part is the reason why moderates are supposedly on board because the bill is supposed to pay for itself. Ultimately, this is the bare minimum that I would be, uh, the bare minimum that I would be happy with, okay? The absolute bare minimum that I would be happy with. I am happy with this. It could be better, but I'm happy with what's going on here. It's definitely good. As far as Biden goes, I mean, I, I briefly did talk to uh, uh, John Lovett about this as well. He is the consensus ruler, right? He's the consensus Democrat. And the consensus has actually shifted further and further to the left. Like, trillion dollar with a T, uh, relief packages, infrastructure packages, these things are unheard of in the Democratic Party's past. Unfortunately, it moves very slowly. Progress is very, very slow, uh, and it's not, it, it's not even meeting the basic necessities and the basic demands that people are making, but it's still good. Larry Summers is crying right now. Yeah, he's crying into his fucking millions of dollars. Some of the extra details from Jeff Stein, uh, the White House economics reporter for the WAP, Washington Post. Report, reposing for extra super duper clarity for people who do not read carefully. This is not a leak of the White House Dem plan. Just rough estimates of what various items cost to think through what $3.5 trillion might get you. These estimates were done previously by the CRFB and other groups, including the White House, and do not reflect inside knowledge on the amount of spending that will be in the final plan. Um, the climate target goals that we have for the Democratic plan is 80% clean electricity by 2030 with, a, with introducing a clean energy standard, clean energy and vehicle tax incentives, 
clean procurement, weatherization and electrification of buildings, and a clean energy accelerator. Now, we'll see what happens. I don't know if it will, I don't know how the moderate Democrats, including Joe Manchin, will feel about it, but... I mean, even before I say that, there you go. Good news, bad news for Dems on the management front. Came out of Biden lunch without much heartburn for the top line spend. But boy, does he have thoughts on climate provisions. You cannot be moving towards eliminating fossil fuels, he says. Joe Manchin says he's concerned about maintaining the energy independence the United States of America has. That reminds me, man. Uh, I wonder why Joe Manchin had, has a, a take like that. That's really interesting. I mean, this probably has nothing to do with it, right? I mean, that would be... That would have nothing to do with it, right? No, no, no shot. I mean, that's crazy. No, no, Joe Manchin is doing this for, you know, the 50 coal miners that fucking work in West Virginia that still have a job that haven't been eliminated due to automation. No, it's, it's, it's certainly... It's certainly because he cares about the coal miners, all 10 of them. Wait, wouldn't moving to renewable energy make us even more independent? We can generate our own wind solar energy with the Midwest Plains LMAO? No. Unfortunately, the only real part about this criticism is that renewable energies are not as efficient as as fossil fuels are. Now, part of the reason is because we just simply have not invested the same amount of R&D and same amount of subsidies to the fucking renewable energy industry in comparison to fucking, in comparison to fossil fuels over the course of the past century. So, that's the reason. And, oh no, yeah. A call to lower the age for Medicare from 65 to 60, not 55. And progressives are still fighting on Lowering eligibility from 65 to 60, but not to 55. Also, we don't know what the, uh, we don't know what the details are of this yet. It's coming out now. Representative Jayapal says she's been told that the budget resolution will include enough funding to both lower the Medicaid, uh, Medicare eligibility, age, and expand benefits to cover dental, hearing, and vision. Previous reports suggested only the latter was likely. Exactly okay, that's this is like baby, happy very months, new news. Birth. This is as recent as fucking 40 minutes ago. So that's cool. Um, so we got funding for clean energy. I mean, this is still pretty almost half of what the progressives wanted to the tune of six trillion dollars. So this is going to be this is a neutered bill. To what the original bill was going to be. But in order to maintain uh, democratic support across the line, across the entirety of the party line, because you do have people like uh, Warner and also, uh, you know, Manchin and uh, other moderate democratic senators who have their own constituencies that don't even give a shit about like fiscal austerity, but they make it seem as though they do. In order to make them come to terms with this bullshit, uh, they had to, uh, you know, make it seem like they were lowering Drink her goddamn water. Uh, the spending. Democratic aid, the agreement would prohibit tax increases on small businesses and people making under $400,000. President Biden will join the, the Senate Democratic right. lunch today to discuss details of the plan. As Senate Democrats were negotiating their new spending deal, the bipartisan group of 22 senators were hashing out the last remaining issues of their own plan. They are hoping to nail down details of the $579 billion deal before the end of the week. The next step includes the Congressional Budget Office doing a... No, I didn't say Warren. I said Warner, not Warren analysis to see if the provisions in the agreement will actually offset the cost of the bill. Doing the math. Let's bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent and host of Way Too Early, Casey Hunt. Also with us, MSNBC contributor Mike Barnacle. So Casey, these two plans kind of working their way down the road, road side by side, what's at stake here and, and what are the potential pitfalls? 
Well, I mean, this is basically uh, the definition of success or failure for the Biden administration, the way they've set this up. They've said to voters, we're going to put these ambitious plans in place. They know that they need to do it uh, ahead of the midterm election so that they can show that they have actually taken action and followed through. And we are now on this two-track strategy that we've been uh, following. I don't know which number infrastructure week we are on by this point, but they're hoping that it's one of the last couple, at least for the bipartisan plan. They really want to get it done this summer. And that big uh, okay, I'm going to give you guys some of the details, okay? From Sahil Kapoor. Bernie Sanders, Senate Budget Committee Chairman on policy targets in the $3.5 trillion bill. Now, we don't know the full details of this bill yet, okay? We don't know. Lowering the Medicare age to 60. Expanding the Medicare benefits through dental glasses dental vision and hearing aids, negotiating drug prices. There's money for child care in there. There's money for climate in there. There's immigration and green cards uh, reform there as well. There's the PRO Act, and there's tax hikes on wealthy plus large corporations. These are going to be modest tax hikes. Don't get too fucking excited. Okay? Now, that last part is the reason why moderates are supposedly on board because the bill is supposed to pay for itself. Ultimately, this is the bare minimum that I would be, uh, the bare minimum that I would be happy with, okay? The absolute bare minimum that I would be happy with. I am happy with this. It could be better, but I'm happy with what's going on here. It's definitely good. So, as far as Biden goes, I mean, I, I briefly did talk to uh, uh, John Lovett about this as well. He is the consensus ruler, right? He's the consensus Democrat. And the consensus has actually shifted further and further to the left. Like, trillion dollar with a T, uh, relief packages, infrastructure packages, these things are unheard of in the Democratic Party's past. Unfortunately, it moves very slowly. Progress is very, very slow, uh, and it's not, it, it's not even meeting the basic necessities and the basic demands that people are making, but it's still good. Larry Summers is crying right now. Yeah, he's crying into his fucking millions of dollars. Some of the extra details from Jeff Stein, uh, the White House economics reporter for the WAP, Washington Post. Report, reposting for extra super duper clarity for people who do not read carefully. This is not a leak of the White House Dem plan. Just rough estimates of what various items cost to think through what $3.5 trillion might get you. These estimates were done previously by the CRFB and other groups, including the White House, and do not reflect inside knowledge on the amount of spending that will be in the final plan. Um, the climate target goals that we have for the Democratic plan is 80% clean electricity by 2030 with a with introducing a clean energy standard, clean energy and vehicle tax incentives, clean procurement, weatherization and electrification of buildings, and a clean energy accelerator. Now, we'll see what happens. I don't know if it will... I don't know how the moderate Democrats, including Joe Manchin, will feel about it, but... I mean, even before I say that, there you go. Good news, bad news for Dems on the mansion front. Came out of Biden lunch without much heartburn by the top line spend. But boy, does he have thoughts on climate provisions. You cannot be moving towards eliminating fossil fuels, he says. Joe Manchin says he's concerned about maintaining the energy independence the United States of America has. That reminds me, man. Uh, I wonder why Joe Manchin had, has a, a take like that. That's really interesting. I mean, this probably has nothing to do with it, right? I mean, that would be... That would have nothing to do with it, right? No, no, no shot. I mean, that's crazy. No, no, Joe Manchin is doing this for, you know, the 50 coal miners that fucking work in West Virginia that still have a job that haven't been eliminated due to automation. No, it's, it's, it's certainly... It's certainly because he cares about the coal miners, all 10 of them.
Wait, wouldn't moving to renewable energy make us even more independent? We can generate our own wind solar energy with the Midwest Plains LMAO? No. Unfortunately, the only real part about this criticism is that renewable energies are not as efficient as, as fossil fuels are. Now, part of the reason is because we just simply have not invested the same amount of R&D and same amount of subsidies to the fucking renewable energy industry in comparison to fucking in comparison to fossil fuels over the course of the past century. So that's the reason. But it does not matter. It, it literally does not matter. Stop with the nuclear takes, please. Nuclear energy would not even be helpful for maintaining energy independence in the short term. So I don't know why fucking STEM Andes who love nukes uh, forget that reality. The amount of time that it takes... Wrong. Okay, the amount of time it takes to fucking build nuclear power plants. That is before we get to nuclear waste. And I'm sure everyone's going to tell me about how uh, there's better ways of dealing with nuclear waste. And it's up to the human error and shit like that. But anyway, the only reason why we even got to this is because we were talking about energy independence. And energy independence is difficult to achieve. It's like a fucking imperialist ass take, but whatever. Energy independence is difficult with uh, exclusive uh, usage of renewables because unfortunately, renewable energy, no matter what you do, the, the, the efficiency of renewable energy is nowhere near as good as currently at least, as good as uh, fossil fuels. Okay. Let's keep going. We only have a few years until climate change is irreversible, 2027-ish 2020, to 2040. It would make sense that we need spending climate spending like ASAP and revitalize the clean energy industry to combat global warming. Yeah. Um. What? That's not real, dude. I don't believe this. A YouGov economist poll found that 40% believe COVID was exaggerated for political reasons. 40% believe millions of illegal votes were cast in 2020. 20% believe the U.S. government is putting microchips in COVID vaccines. 17% believe vaccines cause autism. And 12% believe the moon landing was fake. Honestly, when I see shit like this, I'm like, fuck it, dude. Yeah, fuck nukes and, and fuck renewable energy. We're dead. We're, we're literally fucking dead. I mean, this is like, this has to be online. Like this study... I mean, there's the methodology right there, but it's a YouGov economist poll, and it literally reads like a dumbass poll that you would have on some fucking subreddit. 1,500 people, dumbass. I mean, still. It's like, it's, what do you think that like every fucking poll samples uh, the entirety of the United States or something? It's a fucking, it's a decent sample size. Like 12% of that poll thought moon landing was fake. So you can see certain conspiracies losing wind and certain conspiracies popping the fuck off. And I assume a lot of that has to do with Politically motivated media coverage. That's it. No one's talking about the moon landing being fake. Everyone's talking about how COVID was exaggerated for political reasons. And for that reason, that's why these people are, you know, that's why these people believe this shit. Anyway, um, it doesn't really matter. Like I said, reading polls like this, Reading polls like this unironically make me uh, not care about fucking death and destruction that is going to fall upon this planet. Okay, I, I see shit like this, and then I see people in my chat confidently saying 1,500 is a sampling size. That's so tiny. 
Obviously, every poll needs to cover 300 million people minimum. And then I hear about all these, like, fucking uh, derailments on stream, and I say to myself, eh, fuck it, you know? Maybe the Exxon lobbyists are correct. Why should they give a fuck? We're too dumb to fucking save ourselves, dude. We're hogs. Yeah, I'm just straight doomer-pilled currently. That's where we're at, boys. This is where we're at, officially, okay? This is where the fuck we're at. Uh, not the best. Not the worst. There are, um, I don't know how the bill pays for itself. I don't even understand, nor do I care as to why the bill should pay for itself. I think it's like, it's idiotic. Because it doesn't make political sense. It doesn't make sense from a policy point of view. Because absolutely zero people care about a bill that is self-paying. Like, no one cares. I'm sorry. No one fucking cares. And it certainly doesn't make uh, sense from a political uh, point of view. Again, no one fucking cares. They're using dynamic scoring in the budget. Higher, ta higher tax on the wealthy and corporations is how it pays for itself. I guess the only good politically sound thing that this bill does is that it justifies a tax hike on corporations and the wealthy, a modest one, but still a tax hike on the corporations and the wealthy, which is a good way to justify it by saying, hey, you care about the budget here. This is a balanced budget bill. Could you explain why no one should care? Or did you already address this about fucking austerity? Because we're the United States of America, dude. That's why. It's literally why. We print an endless amount of money to stabilize the economy. And in a, in a panic situation like uh, the peak of COVID. Announcing shutdowns and shit like that. But when it comes to helping American citizens. Rebuilding our infrastructure. Building a robust elder care economy and industry. Subsidizing green energy initiatives in an effort to tackle climate change and make energy, renewable energy more efficient. Especially when it's a growing sector. When it comes to things like that, we never have money. We constantly talk about the budget, the budget, the budget, the budget. Austerity, austerity, austerity. There has never been an austerity conversation when it comes to our endless military spending. There's never an austerity conversation when it comes to cutting fucking taxes for the wealthy and corporations. That's why I am just repeating the same exact shit that these politicians routinely repeat, which is they don't give a fuck about austerity when it comes to things that they care about. I just happen to fucking care about rebuilding our infrastructure, building broadband coverage all around the country, building roads. Bridges, rebuilding uh, bridges, fixing up our dams so they don't fucking, you know, flood. Reshifting all of our subsidies from the fossil fuel industry that has taken an endless amount of money for far too long and reinvesting it into green energy, renewable energy initiatives, a sector that is growing rather than getting smaller like the fossil fuel industry is. Okay. The war on drugs has really been a war on people, particularly people of color. The Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act would help put an end to the unfair targeting and treatment of communities of color by removing cannabis from the federal list of controlled substances. This is an idea, not all, it's not just an idea whose time has come, it's long overdue. When you said, and thank you. Here is the motherfucker that's like the voice for the moderates speaking about this $3.5 trillion uh, budget reconciliation package. Chuck Schumer for his leadership and the whole committee. Um, there are times to do really big things. This is one of those times. A time to think about in the 21st century, does, is America going to lead the way? Or other nations like China going to 
outcompete us, outinvent us. Hell yeah, brother, we're doing it for China. Now, some of you are going to say this competition against China is the uh, justifiable rhetoric. Some of you uh, will say that, uh, why the fuck are we agitating against China? I like to think that it is so incredibly fucking sad that Democratic senators, Republican senators, just American politicians in general can't even justify fucking building infrastructure in this country, which is like broadly popular without trying to agitate against fucking China. Like, Americans are such dumb fucking hogs, regardless of where they stand, okay, on the political spectrum, that, like, they can't even justify helping themselves or allowing the government to help them without being like, we're doing this out of spite. The Chinese are gonna hate that we're cleaning our fucking energy infrastructure, brother. I fucking, hell yeah! Yay, yay! Brother, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I don't want a single fucking dime being spent on renewable energy unless them Chinese are fucking mad. I hate it. They hate it when we got dams that are not in a state of disrepair, brother. Us out in this. The plan we put together, which is fully paid for, will make the investments in American families. We'll take on what Bernie and frankly led mostly by Sheldon Whitehouse, the existential threat of climate change in a way that will meet the needs of leading the world on this critical issue. I make no illusions how challenging this is going to be, and I want to thank all of the members in both parties uh, who are working on the bipartisan infrastructure plan. We've got a ways to go on that. Um, but huge promises made. Uh, I've been in this job for now about 12 years. I can't think of a more meaningful effort that we're taking on than what we're doing right now. Probably more meaningful than anything I've done in my public service. I think a lot of us have realized this is that moment where we rally uh, this country to uh, dream big and do big things. And I think over the next couple of weeks, uh, you're going to see that executed on the floor of the Senate. So. Um, the PRO Act could potentially be taken under, uh, which is surprising, but the PRO Act could be, uh, uh in the budget reconciliation as well. There, a lot of people are mentioning this. The PRO Act is currently, I guess, labor's biggest goal in an effort to make organizing in the workplace easier. Um, it's a bill that will protect worker organizing efforts. Obviously, I don't need to tell you at this stage how important that is, how important unions are, and how important workplace organizations are, um, and how this is the next step towards democratizing the workplace. There was a bill that passed back in March uh, with the House Democrats that approved a bill that would provide protections for workers trying to organize. And it passed with five Republicans joining Democrats in favor of it. Now, of course, until this budget reconciliation, it was slated to be dead in the water in the Senate. But let me give you a little bit more about the PRO Act, Protecting the Right to Organize Act. Let me give you a little bit more details about it. According to Trumka, the head of the AFL-CIO, the PRO Act would... It protect and empower workers and exercise our freedoms to organize a bargain. It's a game changer. If you really want to correct inequality in this country, wages and wealth, inequality, opportunity and inequality of power, passing the PRO Act is an absolute essential to doing that. One of the greatest examples I can give you as far as the importance of labor unions in this country and collective bargaining agreements that labor unions advocate for is a comparison to other OECD nations. America has an 11% unionization rate 
Okay, that means only 11% of our entire workforce is unionized. Okay? This is a tiny, tiny number when compared to other OE comparable OECD nations like France, Sweden, Germany, and many others in the European continent, even Canada, as a matter of fact. Unions are the only way that you can collectively bargain to improve your benefits, to increase your wages, and to stop, uh, you know, unnecessary, uh, not unnecessary, but like to stop your bosses from dictating your life and uh, put you in unsafe conditions, for example. When you look at collective bargaining agreements in places like France, even if the unionization rate is low, their agreements encompass like 98% of the entirety of the uh, uh, French uh, workplace. It's not an accident that other countries have higher wages and better benefits. It's deliberate. The reason why they are able to do such things like even have, you know, parental leave, for example. The reason why they're able to do this is because they have unions bargain on behalf of the entirety of the workplace. The PRO Act will at least help the unionization efforts a little bit. Of course, the National Retail Federation has called it the worst bill in Congress. Let's look at the five provisions. So-called right-to-work laws in more than two dozen states allow workers in union-represented workplaces to opt out of the union and not pay union dues. This is a crippling measure to destroy unions because unions cannot operate without dues. You will not have a strike fund. If you do not have a strike fund, then you can't go on strike because then your members won't be able to stay strong. The only way for a labor union to demonstrate their force is by engaging in a work stoppage, i.e. a strike. That's why everyone needs to pay in to the union in unionized workplaces. At the same time, such workers are still covered under the wage and benefits provision of the union contract. The PRO Act would allow unions to override such laws and collect dues from those who opt out in order to cover the cost of collective bargaining and administration of the contract. Okay? Number two. The right-to-work laws are fucking devastating and disgusting. Uh, a, similar, a, uh, a similar concept for the public sector also passed, uh, well, not passed, but uh, was defended in the Supreme Court in, a famous Jan in the famous Janus decision that um, rendered uh, public sector unionization or public sector union uh, employees to also... Uh, be in a threatening position. The viability of unions in the public space or in the public sector are also now under threat. Number two, employer interference and influence in union elections would be forbidden. Company-sponsored meetings with mandatory attendance are often used to lobby against a union organizing drive. Such meetings would be illegal. Additionally, employees would be able to cast a ballot in union organizing elections at a location away from company property. A lot of the unionization process revolves around um, threats, basically. Okay? A lot of the unionization process revolves around the company, the bosses, not directly threatening you because it's currently illegal because we have at least some, some kind of protection afforded by, uh, uh, afforded by the government. But for the most part, What companies like Amazon do, as I've covered closely, the uh, Bessemer, Alabama uh, unionization efforts, they will threaten employees that are trying to unionize and tell you, like, you know, you're going to lose money to the dues, you could buy a PlayStation, things that we've seen many, a million times over. Three, often even successful union organizing drives fail to result in an agreement on a first contract between labor and management. The PRO Act would remedy that by allowing newly certified unions to seek arbitration and mediation to settle such impasses in negotiations. And the law would prevent an employer from using the employee's immigration status against them when determining the terms of their employment. It would establish, lastly, it would establish monetary penalties for companies and executives that violate workers' rights. Incredibly important. Corporate directors and other officers of the company could also be held liable. All of this is very good. 
which is precisely why some Democrats and also nearly the entirety of the Republican Party would be against it. This is populist, okay? Technically, it's populist. It is pro-worker. And now, from what I understand, we could potentially have it in the, uh, the $3.5 trillion infrastructure bill. Good news. And we're going to move on to uh, more news. Uh, the, the voter rights protections news block from Senator, or Senator, what the fuck? President Biden's impassioned speech. Attempts to restrict voting remain in Washington. The Republican-controlled legislature passing their version overnight, but unless the Democrats return soon, it will expire. This is turning into a real showdown. Texas's Republican governor is now threatening to arrest those Democrats when they get home. For now, their plan is to stay in Washington and push for procedural changes on a national level. Basically, they're really trying to run out the clock back in Austin until their legislative accession expires in August, in early August. But look, George, eventually they do have to go home. And at the end of the day, it's the Republicans who've got the votes right now on this one. And Cecilia, Senate Democrats overnight also announced that they've reached an agreement within their party at least on President Biden's major infrastructure investment proposal. Yeah, exactly. That's that $3.5 trillion price tag over the next 10 years. They're saying it would cover, likely cover things like those human infrastructure projects, a community college, child care, expanded Medicare. Much of this is going to be paid for. We've been talking about this by tax increases on corporations and the wealthy. This is likely to be a party line George uh, vote. George, the president, expected to head to the Hill today to try to shore up support on this. Right, but it's not clear that all Democrats are supporting it right now. Okay, Cecilia, thanks very much. Here, we'll, we'll, do a, we'll do a quick button on the uh, Haitian-American uh, suspect in the assassination who worked on and off as a DA informant. More information is coming out of the uh, Haitian president's assassination that, that at least make me question my original uh, idea that like uh, maybe this was not the work of the uh, State Department because there is like hella involvement with the State Department. I still do think that they are private contractors. Especially because, like, America doesn't really assassinate leaders that are American puppets, but who knows? Maybe they, wanna, they wanted to install someone else. Like a uh, Erdogan versus uh, Fethullah Gülen situation. But having said that, Erdogan was uh, not necessarily uh, as pro-America at the time as uh, the Haitian president was at the time of his assassination, so... This morning, we have new information on a U.S. citizen arrested in Haiti in connection with last week's presidential assassination. A U.S. law enforcement source tells CBS News that Joseph Vincent was indeed a confidential informant for the Drug Enforcement Administration on and off for several years. Our source also says he was not involved with the DAA at the time of this attack. Mola Lange is in Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, with more on the story. Mola, good morning to you. Well, good morning. Vincent was one of about 30 people and one of three living in Florida that Haitian police say played a role in President Moise's assassination. He claims he was there simply as a translator. As you mentioned, we now... Yeah, he was just a translator, dude. Translators always say, hey, we're with the DEA when they're doing an assassination. It's something that translators just simply do, you know? Oh, man, I was just a translator, which is why I yelled... That I was a fucking federal officer uh, in the process of assassinating the fucking Haitian president. Another suspicious part of this process is the fact that not a single one of the bodyguards of the Haitian president at the time were harmed. Like, it makes no sense. I mean, this is a fucking setup, dude. 100%. One, one know that he previously had ties to the U.S. government as an informant. President Jovenel Moise was gunned down by assailants claiming to be members of the DEA exactly one week ago. We now know one of those men, 55-year-old Haitian-American Joseph Vincent, previously worked for the DEA as an informant. The Drug Enforcement Administration denies any involvement with the assassination. Former DEA agent Mike Vihill has worked with informants in Haiti, but he had not worked with Vincent. These are individuals that are usually engaged in criminal activities but we use them because they can provide very valuable information on the activities of criminal groups. 
the organizational hierarchy of these groups as well. Haitian police remain focused on another Florida resident they arrested, Christian Sanon, who they say was a key player in the assassination. We spoke to Haitian professor Michel Planchet, who confirmed reports that he and Sanon spoke as recently as last month. Is Christian Sanon the fucking doctor? This is a really interesting figure. Uh, the one that, yeah, he is the doctor. Okay. He's a, he's a pastor out of Florida who like, who got on a fucking private jet. I thought he was also a doctor. Is this not the fucking doctor? Yeah, he is a medical doctor. Or at least on social media, he considers himself to be a, he, he uh, you know, presents himself as a medical doctor and Christian minister who's providing leadership for Haiti throughout a life of positive action and absolute integrity. This dude was on a fucking private jet with uh, some of the people, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Christian Emmanuel Sanon, a Haiti-born 62-year-old who's been living in Florida for more than two decades, helped recruit the group of some two dozen people who stormed Haiti's presidential palace on July 7th and served as a middleman to the unnamed masterminds of the operation. Very interesting. Haiti's police chief, Leon Charles, said he believed a high-profile doctor had hired a Miami-based security firm, which had in turn hired a group made up of mostly Colombian former soldiers to carry out the operation. On Sunday, Charles identified Sanon by name, said he had arrived in Haiti in June with political motivations, traveling on a private jet with several of the alleged perpetrators of the shooting. What is also remarkable in the situation is that these motherfuckers, like, like they were, they were in and out. Like, they were very efficient at murdering, but then they didn't escape the country, which makes no sense. Why wouldn't you try to run away from the country after doing an assassination on the president? They were so easily caught. Like, who the fuck does that? It's just like every part of this story is incredibly sus, dude. This is among us to the... Among us through and through. You got an unpopular president being assassinated. None of the bodyguards are harmed in the process. These guys present themselves as DEA agents, falsely. Okay? There's Americans involved. Like, American Haitians involved in the process. It's just like, it's built like a fucking movie, dude. And I still don't know. I mean, I will still not be able to form a coherent opinion on this unless I figure out who the hell is going to, uh, who the hell is going to be installed as the new leader. Because this did happen at a time when, uh, although uh, uh, Jovenel is a, a U.S. puppet, this did happen at a time when he was refusing to leave power. Also, remember Barbecue? Who people thought was a lump and parole turned revolutionary uh, Marxist-Leninist? Barbecue's vowed to avenge the death of the president. But that's kind of strange if he was so anti uh, the, the Haitian government, you know, rising up to lead a proletarian revolution, then why the fuck is he uh, vowing to avenge the death of the person who he, uh, in a actual proletarian uprising, would want to murder himself? Kind of curious. A Florida-based friend of Sanon told AP that the pastor had been duped by people claiming to represent the U.S. state and justice departments who wanted to install him as president. Sanon had believed the plan was to arrest but not kill Moise, the friend, he cl the friend claimed. Interesting stuff. And that Sanon told him he was on a mission to replace Moise and that Moise would be resigning soon. Moise denies any involvement. Here at the Prime Minister's residence, the acting head of government is requesting patience in the investigation. The question is... Oh, fuck, this dude's just planted outside of his house? That's crazy. ...is how much patience, as fear and instability continue to rise here. Do you feel safe here? Uh, no. No, I, I don't think anyone feels safe. Kalinda Maguar builds clean-burning stoves for Haitians who are living in poverty. 
She told us she has no plans to leave, despite the political chaos. There's a lot of people here that regardless of who is holding the political power are willing to work for their country and make changes happen. I think that's what's important to highlight. You want to be here and you want to be part of the change. Exactly. Well, here in Haiti's capital, the U.S. government making its presence known. A dozen Marines were sent in to beef up security here at the U.S. Embassy as the investigation into uh -huh. the assassination continues.